Welcome, everybody, to another episode of the From Adversity to Abundance podcast. I am your host, Jamie Bateman. And I know I say every time that we have a special guest, but this guest is truly special. She's my sister, Carrie Bateman Buckley uh, of uh, Windsor Bateman Solutions. Carrie, how are you doing today? I'm doing well. Just excited to be here. Thanks for having me. Absolutely. Um, yeah, this is going to be a fun, fun chat. Um, it's going to be uh, different than a lot of the ones we've had already uh, other previous episodes. So, um, yeah. So where are you, where are you joining us from? Joining from Brooklyn, New York. Awesome. I was up there, uh, for your wedding last year, which was a <laughs> ton of fun anyway, Carrie. So who are you, what are you up to? What, what does your business look like? Um, you know, what's your, uh, kind of, what's your story today? Thank you. So excited to be here. Uh, my business is called Windsor Bateman Solutions. We go by WBS to shorten it a bit. And we're really focused on organizational design and strategic planning. Um, my background is in working in large institutions. So previously I was working for the New York City Department of Education, which I'm sure we'll get into more, um, but was a cabinet member there and have worked for other like Special Olympics International, um, worked on projects with the Centers for Disease Control. So ultimately where I've landed in terms of my business is helping large um, institutions or even small startups thinking think about their team and their staffing and what they need to be successful. So we are now uh, in year two of the business, which has um, been awesome, learned a lot. And I'm excited to talk more about that today. Yeah, absolutely. No, I think it's going to be very relevant to our listener. Um, you know, we the listener out there is uh, the primarily made up. Listeners are made up of entrepreneurs um, or you know, budding entrepreneurs, wannabe entrepreneurs, people who are interested in entrepreneurship and potentially making the leap from their W two to starting a business like you have pretty recently done. And um, so I'm thrilled to get into that in a little bit. That's super exciting. And I definitely want to talk more about what, um, you know, what your business does and who you serve in more detail. Um, but before we get there, let's jump back into your backstory. Obviously, um, you know, you're, you're um, one of my six siblings. So I personally know a decent amount of your backstory, uh, but the listener doesn't know who you are and where you came from. So let's talk about that. Um, you know, what's, let's, let's dive in. Where do you want to start? Uh, so my backstory, I grew up in a small town in Maryland, just um, south of the Pennsylvania border. It's called Hereford and I was number six of seven, as you know. And what was awesome about that was always getting to have people around the home. I've always loved being around people and having all the siblings, the neighbors. And um, that was really fun growing up. And I think um, another pertinent detail is um, that being number six of seven allowed me a lot of flexibility to try things out. <laughs> and ultimately, um, I ended up going to the West Coast um, after high school to start the first, the University of Oregon's ever first uh, women's lacrosse team. So was looking at a lot of um, colleges on the East Coast and ultimately picked the one um, that was supported by Nike and just mm -hmm. seemed like a really exciting opportunity. And um, I think that's a thread that we'll probably see continue throughout this time today. Yeah. But I really enjoy starting things. And so it was a huge leap for me. I had never actually been to the West Coast before going out to the recruiting trip uh, with the University of Oregon. So it was my first ever time on the West Coast and then ultimately chose to live out there and go to college there. Uh, learned a tremendous amount by being a Division One athlete, being a female athlete in a world of um, a lot of athletes that were going professional in basketball, football, and just, um, you know, that experience really taught me a lot. And then from there, moved back to the East Coast for a few years, um, or to Baltimore for a few years, and got my Master of Public Health from Johns Hopkins. And then uh, 
throughout that time was working on a project with Special Olympics International and had the opportunity to go international after that. I have always loved traveling. So I spent some time in Southeast Asia working on a project. Yeah, you've definitely been, uh, I guess, a trendsetter, pathfinder. (laughs) I don't know what you want to call it, but within our family, I mean, lacrosse, especially back then was more of an East Coast sport. I know it's grown significantly, but um, in, I guess, five out of seven, seven of us played in college, but, uh, you know, none of us had gone that far away, <laughs> you know, geographically, uh, physically. So that was just, just that fact was a big, you know, a big d- deal at the time for, for certainly for you personally, but for the family as well. So that was, and I know Oregon, you had to travel, just fly a lot, um, to, to play, just to play games. And, uh, but I love the, uh, you know, just, I've been convinced even as the years go on that the values and lessons that personally that I've learned from team sports, and I, I've talked to a lot of other entrepreneurs, business people, I just think team sports are a fantastic uh, avenue to develop skills and and uh, lessons learned and transferable skills that that help you in life and business. So I think that's a phenomenal background for for any entrepreneur, really. Um, but obviously, you've springboarded off of that and done a lot since then. So, um, okay, so pick it up from where you left off. Uh, and just want to give a shout out there to my Oregon lacrosse teammates. Uh, as you were saying, it's so important. And we're still incredibly close to this day. And there are about 13 or 14 of us that stay in close touch, like almost daily. Um, definitely That's awesome. And yeah, like- especially starting something brand new, like you said, yeah. it's you didn't just get plugged into it, an existing machine, you were one of the creators and founders of that program, really, if you think about it. So that, that would bond any unit that, that, um, you know, that that's awesome. So yeah, yeah absolutely. So then uh, you mentioned Johns Hopkins and then, um, pick it up from there. So then, uh, after Hopkins went to Southeast Asia and I was working with the special Olympics on a project in both Malaysia and Thailand, and it was really about, um, developing healthy, the project was called Healthy Athletes, and it was all about health programs, but in trying to develop something that was practical and working with their Department of Education, their Departments of Health, and learned so much there, just the cultural aspect of disability and how it impacts health services and educational services was eye-opening, even um, between the two different countries of Malaysia and Thailand, was very different. Um, one was much more integrated in the community, one in, uh, was much more institutionalized. And so just that experience of learning uh, about the, their institutions and the intersection with culture was fascinating. And mm-hmm. also the opportunity to travel around and work there was really incredible. And now, what uh, was your, let me jump in for, what was yeah. your, I mean, that, cause that's not too many people have done anything like that, you know, at least um, in my world, I'll say, um, <laughs> but what was your driving force? I mean, beyond what you learned from it, what, why did you pursue that? I mean, it sounds fascinating, but what was, what were you, what was in it for you, if you will? Uh, good question. I had been working on a grant evaluation program for the special Olympics here. And so they were funding these programs. So I had done a lot of work on paper of how to develop the evaluation process for them. Mm -hmm. And at the end, they asked, like, would you want to go work in the field? And to me, the opportunity to see it in action was Mm -hmm. what I was eager to do. Um, Mm -hmm. And so I jumped at that opportunity. And and, uh, like I said, spent a few months over there getting to Mm -hmm. work with them. Got it. Well, I mean, as you know, that's the the execution, you know, is critical, right? So on the ground and, uh, you know, ideas are great, but <laughs> how do you actually make things happen? And it sounds like you've got a lot of experience in actually implementing and executing mm-hmm. plans, strategies, et cetera, which I think we're going to get to. So, so where did, where did uh, things take you? where did your life take you after that? So after I spent some time in Bangkok, I, realized that I could thrive in a big city. I think at first I was a little overwhelmed by it. There's, it's a different language. I was learning public transportation systems and 
um, really overwhelming at first, very scary, not in a, a safety sense, but just in a sense of like having to take in a lot of information at the beginning. Um, and once I started getting a routine there and figuring out the bus system, I realized that I really enjoyed living in the big city. Um, and so I ultimately was wanting to come back to the U.S., but was open to either D.C. or New York at the time mm -hmm. and ended up getting a job in New York and moved here shortly thereafter. And now I've been in New York for 11 years, which is <laughs> wild. Never thought wow. I'd be here this long, but here I am. Yeah, I know uh, somebody else who said the same thing um Travis anyway <laughs> um <laughs> that's really cool so then talk to us about the the 11 years in New York yeah so the project I had been working on with the Special Olympics was a funded project by the Centers for Disease Control and so a lot of the work that we were doing was grants-based work program monitoring and evaluation how to essentially determine that the funding that was going to the program was well used in um, creating the outcomes that we were looking for. And so since I already had that understanding, it was something I was able to apply to another project with the Centers for Disease Control. And so the job that I got when I first moved to New York was a project where uh, the Centers for Disease Control was funding the Tourette Syndrome Association, the National Tourette mm -hmm. Syndrome Association. So mm -hmm. I was working with them to teach medical providers and teachers about the disability and how to work with people who have it. Um, mm -hmm. So for teachers, more classroom-based support, and then for doctors, how to identify it and diagnose it. Um, and mm -hmm. really enjoyed that work. Um, it also included a lot of travel, which was fun at the time. And mm -hmm. when you're traveling every week or two, it can get to be a lot. Um, and so after that ended up um, moving over to the New York City Department of Education, where I started out um, in the special ed office, and then ultimately uh, went on from there to hold a number of different roles. Got it. Um, so, you know, I think one thing that people struggle with out there sometimes is maybe they not, may not feel like they're in the exact right role right then and there. Um, what would you say to the person who, you know, doesn't necessarily love their job? Um, but, um, you know, I've, I've got my own thoughts. I'm trying not to unleash them right now, but, um, <laughs> you, I guess lessons learned as far as career transitions and mm -hmm. transferable skills. I mean, you know, you certainly probably didn't know that you'd be where you are right now, 10, 15 years ago, right? So if someone's out there working at a W-2, um, do you have any advice for that person who hasn't started a business, maybe is thinking about it, um, and we'll get more into the, your transition into your business, but um, speak to that person who doesn't love their job, um, you know, and but... Um, you know, may not see where their future is headed just yet. Love that question. Uh, <laughs> Once I finally got it out, right? <laughs> <laughs> it's such a hard one to answer. But my first thought is a job is only one component of your life too. And, um, yeah. you know, I think we put a lot of emphasis on getting a lot uh, the meaning of our lives coming from our jobs. And while it's one factor, I think there are many others as well. And so it's great I'll point. just, you know, zooming out a little bit, note that I also was doing a lot of other things with my life that brought me a lot of joy. Um, and I would say there's still, even if you don't love your W-2, there's still a lot you can get out of it. And to connect those two thoughts, um, I recently completed all, visiting all 50 states. And so there was the personal aspect during the job with the TSA and CDC that I got to travel to a number of different states. And that was fun for me too, just to get to explore and see new places. Um, but there's always a skill set that you're developing along the way, even if you don't know where it's going to lead. And so with that, just the opportunity to understand the public health system, um, the CDC, how they operate, 
it, the job itself, like, I think I outgrew pretty quickly. And so I, you know, was kind of hanging on, but a little bit bored and um, tired. And at the same time, I appreciated the opportunity that I had because mm -hmm. I was learning a lot. I, and just the opportunity to have a W-2, like I mm -hmm. recognize the privilege that I've had to have a great mm -hmm. education. And um, I was paying off student loans at the time. So just having a consistent paycheck is something that was really beneficial to me. And um, so that financial stability was really helpful. And I know that, you know, you can be tired of a job. And yet when you get that paycheck, it's really helpful. Um, so Absolutely. I think. Just recognizing that the skills you're building will come into play later. I didn't see it at the time, but then um, as you were talking about COVID earlier, like mm -hmm. that ended up being a major project I worked on. And so mm -hmm. I didn't really see at the time that the CDC and the intersection between public health and education systems would come into play, but mm -hmm. it was kind of happening along the way without my knowing. And then later on into the future, it did come together. Sure. No, that's makes a lot of sense. And obviously everyone's journey is fairly individualized in, in that sense. And there's no way we could say, oh, you should leave your W-2 next week without really understanding the situation. But I think that those are some key principles you just laid out and lessons you learned. Um, so um, now, obviously this, this show is called From Adversity to Abundance. And so we're going to the listener might be saying, you know, what, what's the adversity we're going to talk about with Carrie. Mm -hmm. um, so, and again, we're, we're this show, we risk just glossing over the, a lot of the ups and downs that, that you've been through. Um, mm -hmm. But let's focus on some of the human adversity that you've dealt with. Talk to us about that. Uh, thank you. I appreciate the opportunity to uh, you know, like I was saying, talk about all the aspects of life that can happen and uh, to bring it back during that first job here in New York, um, had an unfortunate incident. And while I was, my office was in an incredibly safe part of the city um, and I had stepped out to take a personal phone call during the day and actually was robbed at gunpoint, uh, which as you can imagine, was terrifying. And um, that event imagine. was really difficult. I, it, you quickly see the end of your life, which is, uh, it's just hard to process that. Um, and, you know, not only was that event really traumatizing, but then also the court process that went on for three years um, that I had no choice over. I was a subpoenaed witness in all of this and mm. just dragged the process out even longer. And so it was one of those things that I wanted to, you know, work through with a therapist and would love for mm. it to have ended, but I had to keep um, going to court or you can imagine how flawed that system is, um, you know, sure. dates getting rescheduled, having to show up to talk about my experience and just a lot that happened there. And um, so it was a really difficult few years from that perspective of having to process again, like I said, seeing the end of my life and then having to relive it time and time again inside a court setting um, where lawyers are coming after you to protect the person who did this to you. Yeah. So, you know, we won't spend too much time on it, but um, it, it sounds like it, you know, this was obviously overwhelming and, and extremely complicated and an emo very emotional experience that you had and there's no way we can you know really appreciate the depth of of what you went through um but talk to us just kind of in the the you know moments after this happened I, I know you're probably in shock but kind of what is going through your your mind as far as seeing your life um flash before your, your eyes yeah uh, definitely in shock and it just I don't know how to describe it. It's kind of like you just see everything within like a two second period. It, there's just a lot that comes um, to light, I guess. And it's very scary. And then, um, like I said, spent a lot of time in 
therapy working through the trauma of it and ultimately I I don't want to say it's a silver lining necessarily because I think it's really terrible and no one should have to go through it and Mm -hmm. but having the space to work through it and unpack Mm -hmm. that trauma and then um almost not I don't want to say not be scared of anything it definitely to me is the scariest thing someone can go through right coping with that end of life um experience and so then it, it it probably not the right word, but it's almost liberating in the sense that yeah. you've come to terms with the fact that it will happen one day. And then from there, other things become less important and you're a little bit more free to live your life without caring what people think. Sure. No, that's a really, you know, a uh, great way of looking at it. I've, I've not been through anything exactly like that at all. We did have a guest on uh, prior who his name's uh, Clint Fiore, and he survived a, a, a Cessna plane crash by himself and walked away from it. And this is not, <laughs> it just reminds me of some, some of the things you're saying remind, uh, remind me of what he was saying that essentially every day since then is a bonus. <laughs> and he's, uh, he, and he mentioned the same thing where he doesn't sweat the small stuff as much anymore because how could he? Um, so just, yeah. And like you said, you know, we're, we're, we hope no one ever has to go through anything like that, but that doesn't mean that you couldn't have pulled out, you know, kind of benefits or, you know, lessons learned or some kind of good things can come out of bad situations in, in my opinion. So, um, yeah, obviously, sorry that that happened. And, 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 um, you know, the three ensuing years were not easy, either, because it sounds like you were being reminded constantly of this issue that you're this super scary incident that you were trying to move on from. Um, thankfully, you know, you hadn't had anyone, hopefully, um, <laughs> remind you forcibly remind you of this until, until this crazy podcast host, uh, made you talk about it again, but, <laughs> um, yeah. So now once the, that kind of three year period was over, um, were you able to, to move on from that for the most part, or how were you processing things at that point? Uh, yes, definitely. I mean, I think even, Before that, I was able, again, I think therapy is tremendous, um, was able to work through it in a lot of helpful ways and also accept that it's something, once you have an experience like this, it never fully goes away and that's part of the process too. Um, So it's something that is, I'll say, is near and dear to my heart. So I've definitely moved on in terms of a processing it way, but at the same time, I think my heart breaks a little bit potentially more than some other people's when we see things like in Nashville that's happening. I just think Mm -hmm. gun safety is really important. And I, Mm -hmm. you know, might feel that a little bit more viscerally than um, some others who haven't had a firsthand experience with gun Mm -hmm. violence. So and I I imagine, yeah, to motivate us to action too. Sure. I imagine too, like you, you alluded to the fact that it was, you said it was a pretty safe area, generally speaking. Right. So mm-hmm. I would imagine that that's then hard to deal with because you didn't think you're, you're just at work, you know, <laughs> right? <laughs> sunny, safe part of New York city. Right. And exactly. so therefore that's no longer safe right? That in your mind and in your mind or possibly in reality. Right. So um, yeah, there, that's pretty complicated for sure. So, um, okay. So from a kind of more of a, you know, um, career business standpoint, how did things progress, um, since the, uh, in the last few years for you? Sure. So I had, um, moved on to the New York city department of education. So I mentioned started off in the special ed office there and was in charge of writing their whole policy and procedures manual first the special education process in New York City. And so that allowed me to learn the entire system because as you're aware, the special ed process intersects with transportation, with even food potentially, like with every part of the entire system. And so in that year, I learned the system as a whole, which was really helpful because I had to actually write out how it all worked. And then 
um, had the opportunity to be promoted to chief of staff for all of special ed in New York, which is 240,000 students with disabilities here. Um, so yeah, tell, tell the listener, cause I know a little bit about the kind of, give us a little bit of context, like the New York city, what, what kind of budget were you working with? Like compared to, <laughs> you know, yeah. or some kind of numbers you want to throw at this as far as uh, yeah. what you were, what you were overseeing. The New York City system has about 1.1 million students, and so it's the largest school district in the country. The next largest is Los Angeles, and they have about 450,000 students. So just to put that in perspective, um, Mm -hmm. we're significantly larger here than any other system. And with special education, um, not only are you overseeing the public schools, so we had 1,800 public schools in our system, um, you're also supporting students with disabilities who are in charter schools and private schools. Mm -hmm. And so you're responsible for any child in New York City who has a disability um, over three years of age. Um, between three and 21. So even if they're homeschooled, you're responsible for providing support. So Mm -hmm. the number of students was tremendous. And then our overall budget was about $38 billion with a B. Um, (laughs) With a B. Yeah, that's huge. (laughs) uh, So I then went on um, to manage a a portion of that budget as well. Um, So after special education helped roll out our universal pre-K program, um, where we are focused on free childcare, free preschool for all four-year-olds and then three-year-olds. Um, and then after that role was the chief operating officer for a division that oversaw private schools, charter schools, um, impartial hearings for families of kids with disabilities, a number of different facets. And mm. um, yeah. I mentioned earlier the work that we did around COVID. So I was Mm -hmm. actually on New York City's emergency management team for the COVID response as well. That's, uh, man, that's, that's impressive. Um, (laughs) I imagine that just that New York City's, uh, the organizations you worked in and, and oversaw slash helped oversee, um, you know, they're larger than, than many states or, uh, organizations as a whole. So that's, uh, I know you, you did a fantastic job there. Um, what, um, now you don't do that anymore. You have <laughs> to, you're a founder, you, you've, uh, made some changes since then career-wise. What, you know, how did you get where you are today? I love that. And I also was just thinking back to your earlier question about, you know, if you're in a W2 job that you might not necessarily enjoy so much and, um, I really enjoyed my work with the Department of Education, I'll say, and it was really difficult. It's a hard institution to work in. And so to me, something that always made the W-2 job better was learning. And so like any opportunity for that and intellectual stimulation always balanced out the other parts of the job that I didn't love so much. Um mm-hmm which will tie into this next question, because ultimately I felt like I had learned, I don't want to say all there is to learn, it's a huge system, but, you know, I had really gotten to know the special ed system, the charter schools, the private schools, the early childhood. I also had um, the opportunity to be acting deputy chancellor, which is the, on the cabinet second to the chancellor. And so I had, you know, experienced a number of growth opportunities, had really gotten to know the system. And after supporting COVID response, really just felt like there wasn't much more for me to learn. I wasn't really Mm -hmm. growing intellectually or managerially. And so was just ready to make a change at that point in my career. And I wasn't sure exactly what direction I was going to go in. As I mentioned, I have a public health background. So I was thinking of even returning back to that arena a little bit more. So Mm -hmm. I was thinking about hospital administration and then with COVID where it was, that wasn't the Mm -hmm. world I was looking to jump into Mm -hmm. and started talking to a few companies and the qualities that I realized that I was looking for in my next role was variety. I really liked working on different projects and with a number of different people. And so 
that was something that I was clinging to and realized that I liked um, some of the consulting groups I was talking to worked nationally. Mm -hmm. And I liked the opportunity to get to work with uh, groups in different uh, geographical locations. And so Mm -hmm. I was considering and going with one group and I had met with their CEO and it was a really large consulting company. um, And he said something to me in the meeting and he said, you know, I think you're further along than I was when I started this group. Mm. Wow. And um, I'll I'll pair that with the fact that they also didn't have any women in leadership positions. It didn't seem like they had a real motivation to get there either. So to me, that's a clear signal of um, how I'll be entering an organization. Mm. And I really appreciated the opportunity to have met with him and was still considering it, but ultimately I believed him um, (laughs) and (laughs) wanted to really show that a woman could be a successful business owner and Mm -hmm. wanted to set it up myself after that. It's like, if, you know, if it's going to be a long path to prove that a woman can be a leader in this organization, that's not really the fight I want to fight right now. I'd rather go set up my own business and show that you can be successful there. So Mm -hmm. that's ultimately how I landed on opening my own LLC. That's awesome. Yeah. So essentially you had a, what appeared to be a decent opportunity in front of you. Um, but you decided to think bigger and prove, kind of prove him right. If you will, actually, (laughs) um, I was going to say prove him wrong, but really prove him right. And, and, um, Okay, so then you you determine that you're going to open Windsor Bateman Solutions, or how did that uh, process work? Yes, I still was, I'll say, like dabbling at the beginning. I didn't go in there saying like, I want to run my own business. Let's do this. It was more of like, okay, mm-hmm. I'll start here and then mm-hmm. take some space to reflect on what I'm really looking for. And um, well, I think that's a key point just to jump in real quick, yeah. because it's very easy for the listener or even, you know, me to look, look, to listen to a guest or to look back and say, well, they, they obviously had it all figured out. Mm -hmm. You know, Carrie had her 10 year plan um, (laughs) laid out and the reality is eh, not so much. I mean, it's so (laughs) so it's can be more of a day to day or week to week or month to month approach. And it can still be a successful, you know, way of, of progressing through your career or life. So I think that's important you know, you don't have to necessarily have it all figured out ahead of time before you get started. Um, And it sounds like you took a more, a little bit more micro level approach to that part of your transition, you know, from the W2 to the entrepreneurial world. Is that fair to say? That's fair to say. And the one thing I will say that I had planned for in advance was financially, I had given myself a cushion there so that I wouldn't be stressed on that front. And that's, that's really important. Yeah. So I had huge. been saving up over time. Again, not even sure what, if this was the leap I was going to make. Um, but I did have that there in order to support myself as I was. Yeah. Starting. It gives you more options, more a sense of security and, exactly. and, uh, just the backstop. And if, if this doesn't work, okay, I wasted a few months or a year, exactly. but I'm, I can still kind of pivot and go in the, a better direction. So that's yeah. That, that's also easy to gloss over is the personal discipline to save. And I I saw that you know firsthand. You were you were saving a lot from a personal finance standpoint, or at least I saw secondhand. I'll say I saw you know that you have the discipline to do that, um, which is critical. So um, so talk to us kind of you know once you were like okay I'm all in on this business. You know I I've, I've got the name. I've got I'm working on the website. <laughs> What's, um, I I know as an entrepreneur, there's a lot and, you know, a lot to juggle. There's always, there are always multiple problems and fires to put out. Um, but how did it progress uh, up until today? Uh, wow. I love that. Um, and just what you're saying in terms of people starting and thinking that the person has it all together. I remember as I was starting, I didn't know what area I wanted to focus on. I, you know, had worked in special education, universal pre-K, DOE systems, health systems. 
And so I was starting off pretty broad and not really thinking from a sales or marketing perspective or even business Mm -hmm. development. I just wanted to work on different projects. And um, so I remember thinking like I was so almost overwhelmed by that and impressed by everyone else who already had it together, particularly around the website. So Mm -hmm. (laughs) <laughs> I put my website together myself. You know, when you're yeah. an entrepreneur, you're cutting costs and you're wearing a lot of hats yourself. Yeah. And um, I think one of the first lessons I learned in starting a business is that 80% rule and yeah. getting it to be good enough, um, sure. which was really hard for me because I like to make sure everything's mm-hmm. high quality. But when you're starting, that's just not yeah. going to help you be successful. So no, it's, uh, yeah, I, I won't, <laughs> there's so much that you, it's so true there. The, 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 the Pareto principle, I think they call it the 80, 20 rule. And just, I guess, uh, I forget what the quote is, but perfection is the enemy of, uh, the good, a good. Yes. Mm-hmm. Um, it just, it's so true. You just can't perfection is just, you're never going to get there, especially in the beginning of your, of launching your business type thing. So, um, so you, you learned that you were learning that lesson and I, I would guess still learning that lesson. Cause I think we all are still learning that lesson. And, um, so what did that, how did that actually look for you? So, um, yeah, I got my website to a place where it was good enough in about two yeah. days and then just started reaching out to people and wanted to find out from people who had done it how they had gone about it, what it looked like. Also was really intimidated by a lot of these people's websites because they looked so beautiful and mine did not. Um, And someone actually said to me, just want to share that my website didn't, I didn't even bring it up, but she said, I didn't start out with this website. Like it took time to Mm -hmm. get here and you'll learn. And it Mm -hmm. just was really helpful to have some of that encouragement along the way from people who we're in a place that I wanted to be. And so started off very broad, just really reaching out to people, seeing who had some projects that they needed support with and was very open-ended um, and was starting out just by myself at the beginning, which psychologically can be very difficult because you're trying to bring in new business and it's all you And you're learning all the different things along the way that need to get done, like quarterly taxes and contracts um, and how to pitch your service and price it. So that first six months, especially, but year, I'll say, uh, Mm -hmm. just was a lot of learning and um, was difficult in a lot of ways. And that's saying something for someone who loves setting up new systems. Um, (laughs) It just was like this constant influx of new information and um, also needing to complete all the projects myself just because of the capital, the financial place where I was. And so I had reached out, I had some colleagues who had moved on um, to other positions and was fortunate to start on some small projects there. And um, essentially those started growing into bigger projects. And then I also started just um, getting better at how I could package my services and reaching out to more people. So was doing more business development and um, had the opportunity to work with some ed tech companies as they were starting off. Um, And so I was working across a variety of different content areas and providing different services. Mm -hmm. And ultimately, that was really difficult for Mm -hmm. one brain to manage. Um, Mm -hmm. And, you know, also just starting a business and being the CEO and CFO and COO and project manager. It's just a lot for one person. So I started realizing that I needed to focus more so on like Mm -hmm. something that I could replicate across clients. And Mm -hmm. um, that's how I landed on organizational design and strategic planning. Gotcha. Yeah. And that's, um, it's a constant struggle from, you know, I, I never thought of myself as a marketing person, but you really, number one, if you believe in what you're selling, you're, you're in marketing. I mean, you, if you believe in what you're providing, you're, that you're actually adding value, then you should be trying to sell what you're offering. You should be marketing. You should. So whether we like it or not, we're marketing people. And 
um, you know, it, it's a constant, you know, learning process for me as well, for sure. Um, and, uh, I, I think that's critical. So, so it sounds like you took, yeah. And I can just, I'll speak to, you know, from like the podcast, which is not all that I do, but I can, I can say when you, when you launch a podcast, which I recommend once you, once you get <laughs> down the road, um, you know, you want to speak to everybody. You want your listener base to be ex super expansive. You want a million downloads tomorrow. Um, right. but the reality is if I'm speaking to every, everyone in, in the country, in the world, I'm really speaking to no one. And mm -hmm. so, they talk about defining your avatar, making it very specific, you know, age, gender, occupation, even if not every listener fits neatly into that category, that focus is critical. Um, you can then later expand, you know, expand and then contract, expand and contract. These are things that I'm, I'm learning myself. Um, so, so you were able to kind of focus, uh, and so define if you can, who is, who is your, your client? I mean, what, what does that look like today? Um, my client really could be anyone, but we focus on larger institutions. And so in my time at the DOE, I had led a number of office transitions, mergers. Um, unfortunately, sometimes we had to reduce headcount and staffing funding and um, could find other positions for people to grow into. But just realized there was a real gap there between um, the human experience and what people were going through on their own team and mm -hmm. the way that the structure was organized as a whole. So ultimately, mm -hmm. our goal is to help anyone who has a team, um, but mm -hmm. think through how to improve their morale, any staffing gaps that exist from we do a survey, we do a functional analysis where we actually capture every function that each team member mm -hmm. is managing. And then we zoom out and think about the structure as a whole and any staffing gaps that are needed down to mm -hmm. helping think through job descriptions. If at the end we recommend they hire two positions and um, we'll even help them write the JDs for those. Um, mm -hmm. And then there are some teams that we've worked with that are brand new. And so startups um, or even mm -hmm. just new initiatives that are launching like you were saying earlier with the idea and implementation, sometimes you have a leader who has a wonderful idea mm -hmm. and they don't have the capacity to think through the operations. That's where we come in to help think through what the team structure should look like, how to prioritize hiring within that. Mm -hmm. um, one of our clients actually was yeah. a former White House advisor on mm -hmm. global energy, and um, he's been a leader with the Ukraine crisis and he has a lot of funding um, coming in, but needs a mm -hmm. team to support him as they ramp up. And so mm -hmm. we were that, you know, team that could come in quickly to help execute that versus taking a number of years um, to think through all of the needs there. So sure. That makes really a lot of sense. It, but that's a type of work that we do. Yeah, that's perfect. That yeah. Do you have any other just quickly, any other sort of case studies you could point to? Um to, to sure. kind of make this kind of, you know, materialize in our brains? For sure. Uh, we also have been working really closely with Columbia University, um, as I'm sure many are familiar here in New York. They started the first ever school of its kind um, in the nation on climate. And so with that, they had just a small team that was starting off and now it's grown um, over the past three years to offer master's degrees and the future undergraduate degrees. And what goes along with that, of course, is all the staffing and thinking through the operations. And so um, we've helped them build on some existing teams that have merged into the school. Right now we're working with their budget and finance team. And um, so they have some of the capacity that was already there, but also it's a new school. So then there's some capacity that we've been adding. And so we've done a number of projects with them where we're really thinking through the hiring and their growth plan. Um, so it would range from one year to five years in terms of what that staffing plan looks like and also um, supporting with survey and team retreats to really understand the experience of the people who have been there as we're going through that merger. And mm -hmm. um, so that's been 
really helpful to them to get the extra capacity to have people from an outside perspective, capture the data, help break it down. We're really going through slides of data in terms of survey responses. And also we do stakeholder interviews. Um, so we're capturing the qualitative data there. And our goal is to keep the people at the center of any kind mm -hmm. of organizational change. That makes a lot of sense. And that's been a common theme among not, not, your business model, but the, um, among the successful entrepreneurs and business people we've had on this show, it, it almost always comes back to the people and people being the, the backbone of any business or organization, as much as AI is real and systems are super important. We all get that, but that stuff changes. And honestly is, is really secondary to the people of the organization. Um, and that goes back to your, uh, you know, your teamwork at Oregon and, and understanding the importance of working together. Um, so that's, that's awesome. Um, now before we, before I fire off some rapid fire questions, what you, you want, you have something else you want to say? Uh, I was just thinking too, um, that I hadn't mentioned, like in terms of growth for my company that, I then was fortunate to be able to bring some people onto my team, which makes So we must have like oh, similar are we on the same wavelength? Because <laughs> that's literally what I was gonna ask is is instead of just your clients, which is critical and very important, but but how did the growth of your internally your own team? I can't imagine you have a ton of time, you know, that's the that entrepreneurial challenge always is working in your business versus on your business. Um, so, but focusing on your business, how did your team grow and, and what does that look like now? Um, super fortunate. I have a team, there are four of us now, and um, it started like one step at a time, I'll say. So I had reached out to someone at the beginning who I knew had been freelancing and we started having check-ins. And then once I had some projects, asked if she would want to work on them. So started off um, having one person on my team. And then when I was fortunate to bring in another big project, then was able to bring in another former colleague of mine. Um, and so then started growing. And then, um, as you know, have a really important team member who supports mm -hmm. um, with some of the more like administrative functions. And mm -hmm. with that, um, this is the first time the project one of the projects we're working on now is the first time where I've had all of them on the same project at the same okay. time. Mm -hmm. And it's been so fun. They really enjoy it too. And it's just really nice to get to see people's strengths coming together. And the product of what we offer now is significantly enhanced. Um, and not only that, but was also able to work with a graphic designer and updating our website too. Mm -hmm. So some um, capacity growth inside the organization and also had more opportunities to work with some people who had specific skill sets externally as well. Sure. So it sounds like you're the founder and CEO, and then you've got uh, some the three program managers. Is that kind of how yes. it's broken out? Mm -hmm. Exactly. Gotcha. Um, yeah, it's a, it's a constant uh, battle, but I, I, it's, it's a lot of fun. Um, you know, you're never there, but just building that team and making progress together and hopefully, you know, meeting their individual goals as well and encouraging them along the ways. It's, I, I really enjoy that as well. Do you see internally for your, for your business, do you see kind of staying in that, you know, four to five person, you know, realm for a while, or do you, do you want to have, you know, 50 employees in, in 10 years? Where do you see it going? It's a really good question. Um, I think when I was first starting off, it was hard to be on my own and also a nice relief um, in some ways to be able to work independently. But I think after having others join, I just realized how much I love working with people and so really enjoyed it. Um, and also I'm at a transition personally uh, where I'm about to become a mother and really mm -hmm. excited about that. And What's Congrats. really great about, thank you, about being an entrepreneur is the flexibility that's built into it. Um, and I had actually met with a woman a few months ago who's been really successful in building her business. And she was saying um, how at the beginning, everyone was talking about scaling up and she was thinking that she wanted to, but then uh, valued other parts of her life more so. Um, and so 
I'm not sure exactly where I want it to go. I know that I love working on a team. I think in an ideal world, we would grow. Um, like I'd love to be able to build even more of a team, um, but I'm not sure exactly what size that would look like. And yeah. I'm also curious to see how things might shift as my personal life shifts as well. Yeah, I think it's a healthy, healthy answer because no <laughs> one, no one truly has it all figured out anyway. So um awesome. Well, I've got some some kind of rapid fire questions I'm gonna uh rattle off here. Okay. What's one thing that people misunderstand about you? Oh, I love that. Um, I think the I have people who want to meet up during the day. Um, and I think they don't understand that I'm actually working full time <laughs> during the day. So I have a lot of flexibility and I'm also working with clients in a number of meetings. And so I feel like there's like a lack of understanding about what actually goes into running a business if you're not doing it. I, um, hundred <laughs> percent. I, I couldn't <laughs> agree more. Well, especially <laughs> just with working from home, it's, it's, that can be challenging. Um, so looking back, what's one of your biggest failures, regrets? People sometimes don't like the, the word failure, but something you would do over if you could. Uh, my, First client actually just was not a fit for me, um, okay. but I said yes because I was starting off and thought I had to say yes to everyone. Um, That's a really good, yeah, talk a little bit more about that. That's really interesting. I think I could tell from the outset that we didn't share the same goals. It was like close enough, but ultimately I recognized they were looking to use me for sales and their relations um, to get mm. them into certain you know, to unlock certain doors for them, but that for, for your network, basically for my yeah. network and mm -hmm. just not how I operate. I mm -hmm. appreciate my relationships and I want to add value to people, but I just don't approach the work in the same way. And um, mm -hmm. so I was trying to come up with some kind of service for them that could balance the two or thread the needle, so to speak. And ultimately, uh, they had a lot of expectations and I did not enjoy the work and um, it mm -hmm. ended amic amicably, but it just mm -hmm. was a learning for me that I should be a little bit more discerning in terms of the projects I say yes to. Um, sure. And it, it was very stressful um, because it was my first client. So I just thought that was how they all are going to go. And um, sure. so I definitely felt like it was a failure at the time. And of course, now with hindsight, I can see it a little bit more clearly. Yeah. I can just, you know, like in our mortgage note business, we have a buy box for uh, one fund and a buy box for another fund. And it's like, it used to be like, we'd overanalyze all, it'd spend all this time looking at deals. And, you know, now it's like, well, if it doesn't fit in our buy box, move on. And that's right. a little more transactional than what you're talking about. But I can say on the rental side, we've, we, I've gotten better at saying, no, this isn't, this isn't a fit. For, uh, this tenant isn't going to be a fit. Mm -hmm. um, you know, we've had some bad experiences there where we just jump and, you know, the tenant says, we well, need to fix this. And we say, you know, right away. And it, it's a, I think that's a critical piece is you do hold more, I guess, power and um, you have a lot, a lot of, it's up to you. It's your business, you know, who you want to work right. with, who you want to serve. Um, so that's, that's really good. And I imagine that gets to, you spoke earlier about focusing your business more. I imagine those two things are not unrelated. Exactly. Um, if you could go back and give your 18 year old self some advice, what would that be? Oh, wow. That's a really good one. <laughs> <laughs> and even though you're my sister, I did, I, I did not prepare Carrie for any of these questions. Just the <laughs> listener out there. I did not prepare her. <laughs> I wish I had a little bit more grace with myself. Um, I think I help, have always held myself to a high standard. And I think that um, just like allowing myself to mess up a little bit more during the college years would have been a helpful learning experience. Um, so I would say just to like relax a little bit more about things actually mm -hmm. and um, to not sweat the small stuff as much. I was agreeing, not saying you should relax. <laughs> I, I can relate is, is, um, 
what I'm saying. If you could have coffee with any historical figure, I don't know if you're drinking coffee these days, but if you could have a drink or coffee when you're able to with any historical figure, who would that be? Oh, that's such a good one. It doesn't have to be your number one. It could be one of sure. 10 that come to mind. Um, I think right now there's someone who is a leader in the women entrepreneur space. And that's who I would choose to have coffee with. Um, I went to her, her conference recently and she's really focused on marginalized communities, um, business owners. Her name's Rachel Rogers. And I think mm -hmm. I read her book and went to the conference. I think there's a lot to learn there. And so it would probably be someone like her who has a lot of experience in building a successful business as a woman. Perfect. Um, if you were given $10 million tomorrow, what would you do with it? Oh, uh, well, I just took a retirement class online and okay. <laughs> mapped out how much we need for that. Um, so that. That would help you a little bit, right? I would probably <laughs> get earmark the amount that we need to get to retirement just to have uh, that complete and then would find charities and other um, groups to give the rest of it to. Love it. Um how about a book that you could recommend? Do any books come to mind? It could be personal or business related. Um, anything you can recommend to our listener? Um, as I mentioned, I'm almost, I'm um, seven months pregnant and so almost going to be a new mother. And so I've been reading a lot of pregnancy books. So I've been reading uh, books by an economist who really takes a data driven perspective on pregnancy mm -hmm. and outcomes. And so expecting better is the book I've been reading recently where she breaks down studies about coffee, for instance, like you're mm -hmm. saying, and if they have any impact um, and things like that. So that's what's been on my bookshelf right now. No, that's a good one. It's, you know, it, we're learning a lot, even with teenagers, you know, that things from the, from prior to birth um, probably have a lot to do with how someone's life goes. Um, but so uh, what's one thing in your business that you're just one challenge that you're facing right now? I know there's 25, but <laughs> what's what kind of a big one that you're working through right now? Uh, again, going to bring it back to that same topic, but since I've never been here before from a business perspective and maternity leave perspective, just trying to plan for that in a way that is realistic. Um, but also I love my business and um, like I want to make sure that I am prioritizing my baby in the next stage and also would love to, um, come back to it in a way where there's a balance between the business still running, but also having the home life that I am looking for. So just grappling with how to do that right now, I'd say is the mental challenge. Sure. We can't, um, uh, none of us can create more time, right? Right. So, <laughs> <laughs> the one resource that's limited. Um, in your opinion, what is one of the most important personality traits that someone can, someone needs to be successful in your industry? I would say being a good listener. I think that what I love about what we do is we have these one-on-one -on -one meetings with people and we really get to the heart of the matter in the meetings with them. And it's all from listening. So I just think empathy goes a long way in any industry that you're in. Couldn't agree more. It's and seems like it's more of a, a, a more and more of a lost art these days. Listening. Um, what have we not covered that you'd like to? Uh, I'd like to give a shout out to my husband who has nice. been really supportive of me professionally and personally as I've started this business. I think um, we actually had met at work, and so I feel like he had a front he had knowledge about how um, I had been successful in that arena and he never wavered in my ability to be successful in starting my business. And I think it's gone such a long way because even those moments when you're, when you're starting a business and even if you feel successful, you're also still feeling um, challenged in a lot of ways. And it's just so helpful to have a partner who is really supportive and is always speaking, encouraging things to you. And so I think 
that's also been really valuable to me. Yeah, I think that's uh, just for anyone who is in a similar position. It's just uh, extremely, it's overlooked, and it's it's honestly we I should ha- talk about more on the that more on the podcast because it's a critical piece. Um, just especially more and more today, I think working from home, entrepreneurship is becoming even more popular. And but it's you don't operate in a in a vacuum or a silo. Um, the people in your your personal life uh in your the closest people to you are just critical um so and i know from my perspective your your husband has been very supportive so um that's awesome um wh- what else uh is there anything else we should we should touch on carrie um I, we've covered a lot it's been a lot of fun i think Absolutely. the um most important lesson is that if you're wanting to start a business is just to keep going like it will be difficult and there will be aspects that feel like they're going to you know really stop you in your tracks as your or events that will and you just have to keep going and then it can um build over time I love that it's not like you didn't pivot and like you said you focused you certainly took in data to make better decisions going forward you you didn't just like put on blinders and move forward, but you still, you had, you've had persistence and understood this, this may suck right now, but that's okay. <laughs> that's because anything in life is that, that's worthwhile is also challenging. So, um, yes. I love that. Um, it's fantastic. Carrie Bateman, where, um, sorry, Carrie Bateman Buckley, where can our, our listeners find you online? We're at Windsor Bateman Solutions or WindsorBateman.com, Windsor Bateman Solutions, if you were to Google it. Um, and we have an email address, hello at WindsorBateman.com. And you can feel free to be in touch with us there. We'd love to hear from you. Sounds great, Carrie. Thank you so much for being vulnerable about some of the the, the particular personal incident that you unfortunately went through and for sharing about your experience um, and the ups and downs of becoming an entrepreneur and, um, you know, the, but shining a light on the human side of that, we really appreciate you taking the time today. So thank you so much. Thank you for having me. It's been a pleasure. Absolutely. And to the listener out there, thank you for spending your most valuable resource with us. And that is your time. Be sure to check out our new podcast website, adversity to abundance.com. That's the number two adversity to abundance.com. Thanks everyone. Take care.